Hello, I'm John Case, and today we're going to read a story from Bogachetta Flats. It's another in our series of what we're calling our coronavirus series. Something to entertain you, hopefully, and ourselves during these stressed times. We would like to thank our sponsors. We'd like to thank Slidell Magazine and Kendra Manis. And we'd like to thank William Blackwell for the photography and the, video, and the uh, audio. The story I'm going to uh, read you today is a true incident that took place uh, eight years ago. And the story was written eight years ago. It's called Reunions. The story is a bit nostalgic. If you're under 35, you may wish to skip this story. However, if you have a few years on you, you might like to reminisce, and hopefully this story will hold special meaning to you. Of all God's creations, mankind is the most social. We interact positively and negatively with our fellow man. As private as some of our personalities are, almost everyone wants to see, visit, or reunite with someone. You may go to a family reunion where you visit with all your distant cousins and pretend to like the ones that you really don't like. In the end, it's worth the sacrifice just to reacquaint you with the ones that you're fond of and keep family peace, of course. Some people made a go to a church reunion. Some call them church homecomings. At these gatherings, all the members who have grown up and moved away come back to share old memories and, of course, have dinner on the church grounds. Some of the world's best fried chicken, deviled eggs, and iced tea has been found at these reunions. After lunch, they may clean and decorate the graves in the church cemetery. I guess you could call it a Protestant's All Saints Day. Some people go to ship reunions where they visit with the shipmates, the ones they were on board with in World War II in Korea. They know that the opportunity to do this diminishes each year. Some go to battalions or company re uh, reunions and celebrate their safe return from battle and pray for those still fighting for our country's freedom. Finally, some go to class reunions. I had the opportunity to host a mini class reunion and, two weeks later, host another gathering of five college buddies. I hope you enjoy my reflections. Part 1, Class Reunion Number 47 On an April afternoon, some 40 persons gathered at a retreat on Black Creek in South Central Mississippi. It was a diverse group held together by one common thread. We had spent 12 of our early years together. We had played together, learned together, laughed together, and I suppose at times we had cried together. I don't expect that we're a lot different from a number of classes that chose to convene and share old times, especially if you graduated from a small southern high school. You see, southerners hold some things dear that other locales just seem to ignore. We know we're connected by geography, tethered by the land. We love our little piece of the South, and it is and will always be special to us. Our community, meaning the people where we lived and grew up, they're special to us also. We are bound by the stimuli of our family, neighbors, teachers, ministers, first loves, and friends. We are bound together by a fast-fading oral tradition, the tradition of telling stories, and when we're together, we're good at it. We told stories then, and we will tell stories now. We tend to think that we had something special, and I see no reason to rebut that. Most attendees made an effort to drive at least two hours. Some came from as far away as California. They came bearing treats to share, desserts, dips, wine, and other goodies. You understand, sharing food is also a part of the Southern culture. They came early and stayed late, seeing, uh, seeming to want to relive more, uh, one more memory before the day ended. Gone was the pretentiousness that had existed in years past. I remember that the 10th class reunion could be best described as showing off your spouse. The 20th could be described as hinting at the successes that you had achieved. And the 30th was a picture presentation of your grandchildren. Hurricane Katrina interrupted the 40th and we felt shortchanged in not having much time together. This gathering was different. We were who we are and at 65 years old, we felt comfortable in our own skin. Those that were only acquaintances in high school embraced as long-lost friends, and the conversation was relaxed and easy. We shared the joy of victory and the agony of defeat on the football field with an old tight end, a quarterback, and a lineman. Were we really as tough as we remember ourselves being? We shared the tears of lost romance through a class favorite and the homecoming queen, 
who remembered every person that almost every one of us had dated. There were those that some had not seen since high school. There were those who we did not expect to see at all. There were some noticeable absences. Some could not come. They wanted to, but did not come for several reasons. I suspect, however, a few did not come because they chose to remember us as we were. In their mind, we're still 17 years old, wearing white socks, blue jeans, crew cuts, and a ponytail with a ribbon. That is the way they prefer to keep us, locked in time. The time is 1965. Then, there were a few that may not have had good memories, for whatever reason. Our community was real, and there were some not-so-good things that happened to some people. We talked about them some, too. Lastly, there are some that keeping in touch is just not important. This was discussed, and we all have had enough life experiences to understand this, something we might have, to have been able to do 30 years ago. Unfortunately, some were not there because they're no longer alive. We miss them. As the song says, they were done too soon. For me, I could still see the youth on the faces of each and every one. In my mind's eye, they were still young, still at our school, the hamburger drive-in, or the varsity football field. They were still laughing with each other and fearing the bald-headed principal and the old English teacher that looked at us over the top of her glasses. Late in the afternoon when the sun went down, the reality set in that, as young as we still are, a two-hour drive late at night is not as exciting as it used to be before bucket seats and mandatory seat belts. We talked about that too, when your latest squeeze could sit right next to you. It was time to go home. We knew that as we said our goodbyes, there was some that we would never see again. We will not dwell on that. We will only re recharge for another reunion, another year. Now, if that old English teacher could just edit this story. Part two, college buddies. The events in our lives happen in a sequence in time, but in their significance to ourselves, they find their own order the continuous thread of revelation. Eudora Welty. The most pleasurable and I suppose the most disastrous events of our lives happen by chance. Often we have no more control over them than we have over the rising or the setting of the sun. Such was the event in my life in 1965. Having never been to a fraternity party, been in a fraternity house, or actually knowing what a fraternity was, I was fortunate to be asked to join an organization of significant merit at the University of Mississippi. It was 1965 and I was 18 years old. In all honesty, I am sorry to say, I contributed a little to the betterment of that organization, but it contributed significantly to my well-being. It contributed in the fact that it brought me in contact with and opened the door of friendships to a number of guys who would remain lifelong friends. Without this fraternity, it would not have happened, or at least not in that order. Thank you, Sigma Nu. But college only lasts four years for most of us, and as Merle Haggard says, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Those bonds of friendship I made did not dissolve with graduation. They have entered and retreated in my life in cycles, much as the tide in the gulf. As years have passed, their important rises higher with each entrance, as if blown in by a tropical hurricane. I suppose this is due to age, more time to reflect, a better understanding of what is important that is only learned through real life events, or maybe it is influenced a little by knowing that we have more years behind, b behind us than we have ahead of us. In other words, we're getting older. Such was an event that occurred this past weekend, ladies and gentlemen, that was eight years ago. Five guys, some bound by deep friendship, all by the common circumstances mentioned, gathered on Black Creek in South Central Mississippi. I suppose each of us had his own reason for coming or taking the time to be a part of this. We all thought we knew the format, eat, drink, and tell tall tales of our youth and conquest. We did some of that, but not near as much as I'd expected. After all, you can't live in the past forever. What we found was that we no longer had to live in the past to enjoy the present. The seeds of friendship and new experiences were just as prevalent now as they were on the night we pledged. We still enjoyed each other's company, but not because of whom we had been, but because of who we are now. I am not sure this would have happened 15 years ago. As Sunday came, we sat, reminiscing, not as much about 1965, but about last night. We made plans for the future. 
the future meaning next year, not 35 years from now. As we left, I think each one of us felt a sadness, considering a future event may not occur. What if this is the last time? We would not have that, we will not dwell on that, and we will just plan and ready ourselves for the next time when we can add this year's happenings to the tales we tell. Sadly to say, during the eight years, one of those members has passed away. Rest in peace, Alan Bush.